new episode of Live with Carisha. I'm Carisha the Diva, and today we are sitting with American politician and the mayor of Clarkston, Georgia, Mr. Ted Terry. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, you look thank amazing. You. Thank you, Carisha. Oh, yeah, awesome. Appreciate it's good it. To have you. Um, <laughs> I dressed up for you. Thank you. I'm usually more casual, but yeah, I try to <laughs> you put, look nice. put a nice jacket Little on. Little shoe camp. You look amazing. <laughs> Congratulations on all your achievements being the youngest mayor in the city to overall improving the neighborhood. Yeah. How's it been? How's how's the how's the this, this hustle of that been going so far? Well, I mean, I've been mayor for uh, six years now, mm -hmm. and so you know, Clarkston is known as the most ethnically diverse square mile in America. It is. And it is. I know you used to live in Clarkston. I did. I did. I love so, it. I love Clarkston. You know that's, how diverse it is, here. and we have you know we've been welcoming people from. Uh, 40 nationalities speaking 60 different languages for the last 40 plus years. Impressive. So a very diverse community. I've been elected twice now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been an honor to, to serve Clarkston um, because, you know, we used to have a, uh, a culture in Clarkston that sort of said, well, we don't want immigrants or refugees to participate mm -hmm. in our government. Mm -hmm. um, but since I got there, I really did my effort, uh, my best to try to recruit, um, you know, multi-ethnic, multinational, mm -hmm. a diverse group of people right. uh, to be involved in our government. Mm -hmm. um, and we think it's better uh, when more people are included and, it is. and, and diversity it should be all is represented. It all walks of life and everywhere. Yeah. Um, in your first term of office, you made Clarkston a chartered city of compassion mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a welcoming city. How important is that to you as the mayor? Well, you know, look, I mean, when you have political leaders who uh, um, say that um, immigrants are causing crime and drugs mm -hmm. and are going to bring problems, you know, it really um, suppresses, I think, a lot of the the optimism and the motivation and the feeling of your people. Mm -hmm. And so in Clarkston, we've tried to take a compassionate, welcoming approach. Mm -hmm. And when the people in Clarkston know that their political leaders support them mm -hmm. and want them to, you know, work together, to mm -hmm. volunteer, to make Clarkston even better than it can be, right. um, we really have this amazing synergy. Mm -hmm. um, if I was out there saying that refugees were bad, I think things would be a lot worse in Clarkston. That was, I agree with you there. <laughs> By your second term, you successfully committed to having clean energy in a city by 2020, 2050. 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you travel abroad to speak on helping immigration. What was the physical work process in achieving that? Because it says you went, I heard you went to Morocco. I did some research. That's right. Yep. I was in Marrakesh last uh, year, around this time, mm -hmm. uh, for the Global Compact on Migration. So I'm part of a group of over 100 mayors. Uh, around the world who are on the front lines of the refugee and migration crisis. Okay. So mayors from uh, Central Europe, uh, from North Africa, from the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, you know, South America, um, in the Philippines. Um, people who um, ha represent very diverse communities because of the fact that there's 23 million refugees worldwide and mm -hmm. another 16 million that are seeking asylum. Mm -hmm. And so people are on the move around the world because of persecution, because of their politics, their religion, their right. ethnicity, their identity, mm -hmm. um, cartel violence, and increasingly climate disruption is causing more and more people to have to flee their homes. Right, right. And so um, in Marrakesh last year, we were advocating for uh, a, a larger role for local mayors mm -hmm. in this larger United Nations uh, global treaty on how we were going to create safe and orderly migration. Beautiful. How long was the flight? Uh, so from Morocco to Marrakesh, you have to go... Uh, I had to fly to Paris first. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's a good, like, eight and a half hour flight. Oh, geez. And then from Paris to Marrakesh, like an hour or so. Okay, yeah. not so too it's no, bad. So it's no problem. Um, yeah. You announced that you are, y'all, he announced that you are running for the Democratic seat in the state Senate. If elected, yeah. what are your plans for growth and further developments in the state of Georgia? Yeah, well, look, I'm running for the United States Senate against Republican David Perdue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the progressive candidate in the race. Uh, my record as mayor of Clarkston is are the issues that I'm running on. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of a saying that came out of the civil rights movement that said, uh, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you have done, and then I will tell you what you believe. And so my record as mayor of Clarkston has been one of, you know, being the first city to decriminalize marijuana possession, okay. uh, passing a $15 minimum wage, um, making election day a holiday, committing ourselves to 100% clean energy, outlawing LGBTQ discrimination. Mm -hmm. And earlier this year, we even passed and approved the first tiny home neighborhood developments, an effort to create more affordable housing I read about options. that. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. In your words, what sets you apart from the other declared candidates also running for Senate? 
Well, I think it's about um, having a proven record. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's really easy to kind of go with uh, the, the the politics of the, of the, of the moment, mm-hmm. you know. And I would say the Democratic Party is very progressive right now. But a few years ago, it was, oh, we got to be centrist. We have to kind of stick to the, the moderate middle of the road. Um, and my record as mayor of Clarkston the last six years has been one of being courageous and fighting for change and working for environmental protection and mm-hmm. labor protection right. um, and ending the war on drugs mm-hmm. and and uh, dealing with the, the fact that the rent is too damn high. Amen. <laughs> Y'all heard that. <laughs> it yeah. is too damn high. Um, so going into the presidential election, mm-hmm. gun control has been mm-hmm. on the forefront and opinionated strategies. All of the candidates we all know have had something to say about gun control. Um, Vice President Joe Biden unveiled a plan to end the violence by bankrupting manufacturers and buying back guns. What if any opinion do you have on a situation? Yeah, so I'm supporting the March for Our Lives okay. um, peace plan. Okay. Um, they have a plan that would reduce gun violence in half over the next decade. Okay. It involves universal background checks, uh, enacting red flag laws, a national gun licensing system, uh, closing loopholes like the boyfriend loophole, stopping um, private sales of, of guns, making sure that, that all guns are tracked. Because, you know, let's be honest, a lot of the gun violence that happens day to day um, are not necessarily mass shootings, but they're handguns. Right. And they're guns that are stolen, they're used in crimes, um, and they originate from a very small group of, of individual licensed gun dealers mm-hmm. um, or from the private market or they're stolen. Okay. And so we have to beef up laws that actually, um, one, track handguns, um, and then the big issue when it comes to mass shootings, um, you know, there are weapons out there right now that are designed uh, to destroy the human body on a batter, battlefield. You mean the, the bigger guns? The assault the weapons. Assault the rifles. guns that with 100-round clips. Why are they on the can, I... You know, that someone can walk into a Walmart um, and shoot off 100 rounds in less than 30 seconds, mm-hmm. killing dozens of people. And so those need... Uh, we need to restore the assault weapons ban, mm-hmm. and we need to implement um, uh, a a buyback program. Um, it was done in Australia. It was done, done in New Zealand. Um, our modern society needs to acknowledge that not um, that not all civilians need to have access to guns that were designed for the battlefield. And so we need to implement a program um, where those guns will be eventually bought and taken back. Mm -hmm. And that is how we're going to end gun violence. We have to reduce the number of guns Mm -hmm. in this country. I'm okay with that. And I know you mentioned earlier about climate change. I know you're an avid supporter about that. Um, Climate change is real, everybody, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. people might not know. It refers to the rise of an average surface temperatures on Earth with large amounts of carbon dioxide in the air. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the Green New New Deal and how can it help? Yeah, so the Green New Deal is an ambitious program. um, And right now there's two presidential candidates, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, that have both introduced uh, sort of their versions of how they would do a Green New Deal. Okay. And so the bottom line is that as we invest in making our homes, our businesses, our manufacturing more energy efficient, we're going to save money mm-hmm. uh, in terms of utility costs and utility bills. Right. Um, actually, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders uh, just yesterday introduced a Green New Deal for public housing okay. that would spend $90 billion dollars. Um, making every public housing unit in the country energy efficient to the point of being net zero, which means that we can actually help people save thousands of dollars a year on the, on the light bill, on the utility bill. That's a blessing. And so saving money, reducing carbon dioxide, Mm -hmm. um, which is an investment in the future, um, the future for this current generation, but for our generation. Right. Cause you know, we're millennials, right? Exactly. So we're going to have to live on this planet, like hopefully like another, another 70 years or so. Yeah. I, I, I want to get to a hundred. I, um, <laughs> I as well. And we know there's the superstorms are increasing. Um, it's getting hotter in some places, getting mm-hmm. wetter in other places. Floods, sea level rises. Um, it's disrupting our entire ecosystem, and we're going to be paying for it. And so the question really becomes: How can we not? How can we not afford to invest in a clean energy, clean transportation economy? Right. And those are the things that I've been fighting for. Uh, one as director of the Georgia Sierra Club the last three years. I've been fighting the last uh, almost seven years now for more solar energy in mm-hmm. Georgia, which mm-hmm. actually, you know, uh, Carisha, Georgia is like the between the third and the fifth 
best state for solar energy. We're like the Saudi Arabia or the Texas of solar energy. Impressive. And we can produce so much solar energy here in Georgia that we actually could sell it to other states. Okay. And that investment would go to parts of Georgia, quite frankly, that are uh, rural, um, a lot more conservative, mm -hmm. um, and you know have been for largely forgotten. A lot of the investment has been here in Metro Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, but there's opportunities to create thousands and thousands of jobs, millions of dollars of investments in parts of Georgia that haven't seen that kind of investment um, in decades. Impressive. Going into the presidential world, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> Capitol Hill is buzzing with the current impeachment hearings regarding mm -hmm. Donald Trump. How likely is it for, for it to happen? Will the president be impeached, in your words, do you think it's going to happen? Well, you know, I've been watching the hearings kind of here and there, um, yes, you know, two days ago and then today. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look, if, uh, if the witnesses continue to come forward to really, you know, prove and show um, the, fa the facts of the matter of that the president... Um, attempted to bribe um, uh, other uh, another country's leader to investigate a political opponent for his own personal gain, not for the country, you know, the United States national security, but for his own personal political gain, right. um, and offer this, you know, aid that was so desperately needed to protect against Russian incursions. Mm -hmm. um, that clearly, uh, I think, w could can be you know, proven to be uh, an impeachable offense. Um, and so uh, it's going to be up to the House to decide whether they move forward on that articles of impeachment, and mm -hmm. then the trial will be in the Senate. And, you know, right now, Senator David Perdue, who I'm running against, he has already said that he will vote against um, impeachment before there's even been a trial. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in the impeachment hearings and the, the trial in the Senate, he's basically a juror. So we're talking about a juror before they even go into the trial where they're supposed to have an open mind right. and listen to all the evidence. He's already decided what the outcome is going to be. And I think that is unconscionable. Um, he should either rec recuse himself um, and if he doesn't, you know, we're just going to have to defeat him in next year's election. 2020. Trump has been very animated in his speeches about the hearing. It almost seems like he's not even phased about being impeached. Um, for all the rest of the millennials that's watching, not just us, I mean the younger, the younger, younger millennials who really don't really know what's going on in the world, could you please give them a quick situation about what is the whistleblower? Exactly. Uh -huh. What is the whistleblower? Yeah. It's, well, explaining to a, a younger generation who follows the show. Yeah. Well, uh, they're probably well, like, oh, that's the mayor. That's Carisha. I hear them talking politics. Not quite sure what's going on, yeah. but I'm going to watch. Okay. All right. I'll give it a shot. Um, so, you know, look, um, we know that um, if uh, whistleblowers have protections okay. and the whole purpose of being a whistleblower is that if you see something that you think is wrong or unethical mm -hmm. or a potential crime, mm -hmm. um, you should be able to have, uh, the freedom to say, I think there's something wrong here and to report that to the appropriate authorities. Okay. And so what this whistleblower did is went to the independent agency that exists in our federal government, the, the government that is not in charge of Democrat, Republican politics, but in charge of the, you know, being in the best interest of the American people mm -hmm. and investigating that. And if there's cause for concern, they have to report that to, um, you know, uh, the higher authorities. And look, the bottom line is that no one is above the law, including right. the president of the United States. And so what we're talking about right now is um, holding even the president accountable for his actions, mm -hmm. because again, no one is above the law, even the president. Amen. Healthcare prices are drastically insane. At what point do you think there will there will or could actually be a time for free health care for all U.S. citizens? Yeah, well, look, I mean, we live in the, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Of the world. Um, every other industrialized, modern, developed country in the world, including some not as developed as America, have universal health care systems. Right. Now, every country does it a little bit differently, right? But when we talk about the systems in Canada, in France, mm -hmm. in Israel, mm -hmm. in Australia, these are systems that are have universal coverage, they ensure that um, no matter um, how poor you are, how sick you are, um, that, that if, you, if you need the care, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And what we have in America right now is millions of people, uh, and in fact, hundreds of thousands of Georgians who just can't afford to pay 
uh, basic premiums. They, they may not even have insurance, mm -hmm. uh, but they can't even afford to pay their deductibles. Right. And so the reality is healthcare costs go up and up every year. Um, and as the wages don't rise and the rent goes up and education goes up, everything is going up, mm -hmm. uh, people simply are, cannot afford it and are being squeezed. And when you think about um, people who might have pre-existing conditions um, or who might think that there's something wrong but if they go to see the doctor, they're going to have to pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. They might say, well, I'll just risk it. Right. And and people could literally die because they don't get that health care. Right. And so I'm running on a platform of a Medicare for all system. We need to get you to universal health care coverage. Okay. Um, every other industrialized developed nation in the world has figured it out. Mm -hmm. So can we. Um, I'm certain that we can take uh, the lessons from these other, other universal healthcare systems, figure mm -hmm. out what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, and create the best run healthcare system in the world, but for everybody. Because let's be honest, America has the best healthcare system. We have the best doctors. We have the best technology. We have the best research institutions. Right. But not every American gets access to that. If you have money, if you're wealthy, you're fine. Right. But if you're middle class, um, if you're poor, um, if you are elderly, you risk um, falling into this pit um, that so many people fall into where you just simply can't see a doctor. You can't get the care that you need. And I think that's just immoral. And I heartbreaking. Think. And heartbreaking. Very heartbreaking. Um, kind of off topic, but not off topic. A lot of situations have arise, and you know I try to keep you up to date with what's <clears> going on, especially in the black community. <clears throat> a lot of situations have arise with police brutality. Um, we've lost so many innocent people at the hands of police. And I just wanted to get your opinion about, somebody said that they would like to retrain police officers to mm -hmm. let them be more skilled with stop violations. Yes. How do you feel about that? And that's moving forward with making it more safer for us to trust police officers, especially for people of color. Yeah. Well, look, um, as a mayor, um, I'm sort of, you know, uh, on the front lines of what policing standards are in Clarkston. Mm -hmm. And at the federal level, at the state level, there's policies that can be enacted that would encourage local police departments um, to change the way they do things. Implicit bias, um, de-escalation of violence training, um, uh, encouraging uh, police departments to uh, give more certification and training to officers who aren't just about trying to arrest people or, you know, always use their gun, right. but to be more uh, compassionate minded and more proactive, like mm -hmm. almost like having an army of social workers out there. Mm -hmm. Because let's be honest, police know more than probably anyone in our community what's going on because they're out there 24 seven, 365 a day. And I meet so many officers who say they wish they could do more, mm -hmm. but either because they're understaffed or they're undertrained or they're not given that leeway, they mm -hmm. can't actually be proactive in trying to stop problems before they end up in that 911 call. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a pretty radical idea. Um, I think as long as the political system um, puts a layer between the civilians, which are supposed to be protected by the police, and the politicians who hire the police and the police chief, we're going to have uh, a, a miscommunication mm -hmm. um, and a, 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 a deprioritization of the things that the community cares about. And so I am deeply in favor of a policy called civilian-led policing. Okay. And it's a very simple system. What happens is a civilian board is appointed by a local city council mayor or a county commission, uh, a sheriff's office, and the police chief, the person that is in charge of running the police department, is hired by that civilian board. Mm -hmm. That puts... A diverse that, board. On a a diverse board, board okay. one that's trained, this one that is edu highly educated, but also comes from the community that the police protect. And so there's no longer these multiple barriers between right. the, the people and the police. And so if the civilians, the civilian board that mm -hmm. is accountable directly to the civilian population has a direct line and a hiring and firing potential of the police chief, I think that you'll begin to see a dramatic change in the policies that our police um, focus on. Okay. And I think you'll see a more proactive approach. I think you'll see less interest in arresting people, um, more, less, uh, uh, more de-escalation of violence, more proactive measures, mm -hmm. um, and actually getting to the root of what um, some of the the crimes and the um, the public safety issues that our communities have mm -hmm. really you know come from. Okay, for the state of Georgia. 
For those of y'all who don't know, Tyler Perry just opened up his new studio, the Tyler Perry Studios. Mm-hmm. How rewarding is that in the state of Georgia for it to be here? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, look, you know, the Hollywood South is Georgia now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Tyler Perry, uh, I think, has set himself apart, uh, one, as a, a, a black producer, a black filmmaker. Shout out to um, Tyler Perry. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I mean, I couldn't be prouder that, you know, the investment that he is making, the city of Atlanta is making in the Fort McPherson studio, I think it's going to bring so much opportunity, not just for jobs and revenue for the state of Georgia, mm-hmm. but an opportunity for a more diverse group of actors and writers right. and, and and staff and all the the, the film industry apparatuses um, and to open the, the film industry to even more people, right. particularly here in Georgia, which obviously you know Metro Atlanta and Georgia is very, very diverse and has yes. a lot of has a lot of good talent. It does, as we know right here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, so Tyler Perry needs to check out Carisha. <laughs> Come and see me, Tyler. Um, we have not well, we have nine candidates traveling to Atlanta yep. on November twentieth for the Democratic debate. Um, Joe yep. Biden. Bernie Sanders, Camila Harris, Curry Booker, Elizabeth Warman, Paul Buttigieg, I have to get everybody, Amy, mm-hmm. Mr. Andrew Yang, Mr. Tom Sire, who are you going with? Are you supporting any of the candidates? Well, um, I was the first and only mayor to endorse Bernie Sanders in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you remember back in that election, the superdelegates got really involved in that campaign. And a lot of people said the superdelegates you know, should have stayed out of it. Mm-hmm. And so because in my position as first vice chair of the state Democratic Party, mm-hmm. um, I'm a superdelegate. I'm a DNC member. Okay. And so I've committed not to be involved before Georgia votes. Mm-hmm. And so I'll make my endorsement after the Georgia primary. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want I think the people of Georgia should have the first say mm-hmm. um, and who they think should be, you know, their nominee mm-hmm. uh, and who, how they sh- who they should send their delegates to uh, Milwaukee, you know, next summer. <laughs> Yeah, so one last non, non, non-committal. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> one last question. I'm very proud that you started as mayor, yep. and hopefully you'll be going into the United States of Senate in 2020. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Will you someday run for president? Uh, absolutely not. No. <laughs> I was expecting a yes. Okay, so no. No, why would I want that? That sounds awful. Ten um, seconds. Why, why would you not want to run for president? Uh, it sounds awful. Okay. So you want to just write it out to the state senate? Yeah. I, I, my, so my definition of leadership um, is, uh, is one, lead by example. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I really truly believe that great leaders, um, their job is to recruit the next generation of even greater leaders. And so I'm more interested in spending my time recruiting the next president of the United States, the next U.S. senator, the next governor, the next mayor of Clark's um, because the the more people that we get involved in our d- democracy, the more young people, the mm-hmm. more diverse group of voices that we get in our democracy, the more equitable and just our society will be. And so that's actually, I think, my what's been my calling. I've trained hundreds of candidates to run for office over the last you know decade, mm-hmm. um, and I'm committed to just helping more and more people who are passionate about their community, who want to make a difference, help them figure out are they going to run? Mm-hmm. What is their role in actually making those changes Beautiful. and helping them along the way? So I think that's that's my calling. Beautiful. Well, you heard it here. The mayor of Clarkson, Mr. Ted Terry, mayor of Clarkson and running for 2020 state senate next yeah, year. Yeah, U.S. Senate. Mm-hmm. U.S. Senate. We wish you yeah. all the luck. Tell everybody where they can find you. I wish your social media. You know it's very important to plug in your social media. Yeah, well, I know we're going to be tagging each other on Instagram here. Absolutely. Ted Terry won on Instagram. You know, I, 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 a real estate agent in New Mexico beat me to Twitter and Instagram <laughs> And he's Ted Terry. So I'm Ted Terry 1. Ted Terry 1. Yeah, okay. so Ted Terry 1 on it's Twitter okay. and Instagram. What is the best? Uh, Ted for Georgia on Facebook. Uh, my website's tedforgeorgia.com. Uh, I'm Ted and I'm for Georgia. So tedforgeorgia.com. I love it. And this is another, <laughs> another episode of Live with Carisha. Peace. Peace.